I am the domestic abuse, um, stalking and harassment lead for Avon and Somerset Police. Uh, actually, I have somebody who works with me around stalking and harassment because I now see it is such an important issue in terms of improving our performance around that particular issue and particularly the stalking bit. I've got someone who is a Chief Inspector, Kev Thatcher, who is now going to help me. Only on Tuesday, a Majesty's Inspector and Stavery came and had a look at us and they said we're doing some really great stuff but we're not good enough. That's why they come, that's why they tell us, they've given us some great ideas and actually a conversation today, we can take that forward, can't we, with the PCC. So, what I wanted to share with you today, and I knew that all your other speakers <coughs> would, would probably be repeating some of the similar messages, and what I wanted to share with you, because you may or may not know, but policing has a, an enormous responsibility in the management of domestic abuse cases. We are seeing increasing confidence where people call us, which is fantastic. Are we where we need to be? Absolutely not. It is very, very important that we become an agency of choice with those people who don't feel or don't have confidence, uh, and we want them to come because we can do some very positive things about it. They gave me uh, the lead on domestic abuse for a reason. It used to be a very talented uh, detective superintendent, Carolyn Belafonte, but they recognise that actually, at the specialist end of the spectrum, policing is pretty good. <coughs> I think it's fair to say, Fraver and Somerset, do you know what? It's the first point of contact that we have to get right. It is the phone call to the first response. Now, the play earlier talked about the police arriving on two occasions, and it's quite fair. We might think we're doing all the right things, but actually we are not. So whilst we've got a massive piece of work to do, I've broken it down. I'm just going to share with you, you're going to think this is a really simple plan. Do you know what? It's so simple it could just work. So this is what I've broken our plan. <coughs> I'm hoping to put this plan, I'll stop banging my head on that. Um, I'm going to put this plan on our website so anybody will be able to download it. So just to remind myself, because I'm standing in front of people. So the first part of the plan is, we must support victims better, we must listen to the voice of victims more, and we must learn. We must become more accessible for people. And the victim voice bit is really, really tricky. Unlike other crimes, if you're a burglary victim and you get rung up and asked to give some feedback on how it was for you, a lot of people are quite motivated to do that. But many, many domestic abuse and stalking and harassment victims are absolutely not. So whilst we are doing the National Home Office survey, I recognise we're going to get very little gains from that. So I capture the voice of the victim from anywhere where I can get it, whether it be from events like today, any survivor stories, any agency or victim is prepared to talk to us. We get it and we learn it. We take the victim voice, unfortunately, even from those from beyond the grave, through domestic homicide reviews. We listen to what we were being told and we learn. So, the first part of my plan absolutely focuses on the victim, creating the right environment for reporting, the right environment to tell us, and the right environment for police to take action. The second part of the plan, quite simply, is all around the perpetrator. This sounds simple. Of course we're going to deal with the perpetrator of domestic abuse. Domestic abuse is complex because most of the people involved in domestic abuse are in these very complex relationships, as the, as, as the, uh, as the play indicated to us. But we have a big range of options. But with perpetrators, we absolutely have to take positive action. We have to be a bit smarter in identifying our perpetrators, and we now use a predictive analytical tool. And of course we don't rely on this, we're going to use human skills as well. But the analytical tool lists perpetrators and victims by frequency. We then cross-reference with all those perpetrators that are being managed by somebody else, whether that be probation service or whether it be through another perpetrator management scheme. And we actually now can see the number of times we've been to houses, the number of times we've been identifying perpetrators as another tool for trying to get a grip and get upstream for some of these people that are causing our victims harm. There's also something about, they call them victim awareness courses, I, like, I prefer perpetrator management schemes. 
some people here might think it's absolutely inappropriate to be thinking about sending perpetrators on an educational course. <coughs> Clearly some perpetrators are way past that intervention. But actually, in many cases of domestic abuse that we come up against in Bristol, if you take South Bristol as an example, we are talking about generations of people who have suffered from abuse. If we don't even think about trying to educate some very, very ignorant individuals, then I think we are missing a trick. So my job around perpetrators is, yes, we need to take positive action against more. We need to manage them better. We need to use neighbourhood policing to get upstream on them. We need to use technology and perpetrator management schemes to actually understand better who our perpetrator group is, and we need to consider some education. Right, number three, investigation. A lot of the play was about officers going to the house and doing an investigation and completely missing the point. We are just introducing a body-worn video to every single officer in England and Somerset will have one by the first week of January. What does this give us? It gives us another perspective. When the officer attends the address, we have it turned on. It means that when we reflect back over the investigation, we don't miss stuff. It gives an opportunity to capture what does the address look like? What is the demeanour of our victim? Picking up on the subtleties and the nuances of what it's like after there's been a domestic violence incident and police come. I have to say, where they've been used, it is a very, very powerful tool for getting more out of that interaction and more about us taking positive action and not relying on just the commentary in the kitchen about are you prepared to do something about it, what's the risk assessment look like when the perpetrator sat next door, body worn video just gives you a massive opportunity for evidence gathering. My other challenge is, officers tell me that they're busy and I know they are. I've never once heard of any officer being asked to leave a domestic abuse case to go to something else until they are finished. So my challenge to them is, do not leave that scene, do not leave that incident, until you have investigated it to the point where you understand, if you can, what has happened. Let's stop missing very clear opportunities because, oh, they signed my pocketbook to say that a victim didn't want to prosecute. Yeah, but what are you supposed to do if you confronted them there and then with that scenario? Let's be smarter, let's investigate better, and let's make sure we get to the heart of what's been going on in this particular incident. The fourth part of it is around risk assessment. Clearly we have Dash. Actually this week, College of Policing, a chap called Andy Myhill, smart guy, has done a very, very fantastic piece of, risk, uh, of, um, of study about the Dash risk assessment. The DASH risk assessment has served as well. This study, I think, will take us to the next level in terms of our understanding of risk. Officers are given this toolkit, I hate to say it currently, a paper form. We will get it on mobile data one day, I promise. And we actually take the risk assessment to the address. Do I believe that every officer is asking those questions and filling that risk assessment out at the address? Unfortunately, I do not. I think they ask a series of questions and they fill it out when they get back to the station. We miss stuff, we are over-egging some cases, we have some high risk that is clearly not, and we are missing signs and symptoms of frequency and about the nuances around domestic abuse, and we are categorising them as standard when clearly the risk is above that. So actually, we're going to get on top of it, we scrutinise hundreds of domestic, uh, of, of the dash, we scrutinise hundreds of crimes, we do peer group assessments, so I get Somerset to look at Bristol, Bristol to look at North East, North East to look at Somerset to take away that parochialism and that kind of defensive, but we've got to get to the bottom of it, and if we're going to go, and we're going to do it properly, we're going to do a really good risk assessment, and start getting on top of missing uh, the true risk. We had a terrible, terrible case not a few months ago, where actually um, a victim of domestic abuse took their own life. And when we look back, we immediately do that look back about police contact, and there I think were about 10 police contacts. And when we looked at each of those police contacts, I cannot criticise the officers for what they did on any of those 10 occasions, but what I can criticise is no one said, but this is the 10th time, not the first time. And should it still be standard risk? 
And that's where we need to get to with risk assessments. So just some stuff that underpins that. I need to get sergeants and inspectors and chief inspectors and superintendents taking this stuff seriously and making sure that officers know that if they get given a job for domestic abuse, it's not just another domestic abuse case, it is, you know, it is an individual, it is a case that they need to go and with compassion and with intelligence and professionalism to investigate. And that can only come if every leader in my organisation drives their officers and shows their officers that they get the time and space to do the right thing. We're underpinned by media. We've got some really good media campaigns. We are trying to create media that doesn't turn off any particular group. We, we have noticed in the past that we, we've done media that might stop people who are elderly. LGP, uh, BT communities, BME, might think actually they're not going to take me seriously. We're really trying to be smart about the way in which we encourage victims to come forward, reinforce our messages both internally and externally, picking up on the points about, about the workplace. There are a couple of things that I, that I don't know whether you know, a couple of tools, uh, criminal justice things that are happening. We, we now have domestic abuse courts. We bring people to domestic abuse courts quicker. If we actually get them to court, 75% of the time, we, we are getting a positive criminal justice outcome. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, but considering they're complex cases, that's a very good success rate for this, uh, for this area, so that's really good. But we also have the, 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 the domestic violence protection notices and orders. And for those of you who don't know what they are, still got time, um, what, what they are is where you have a prosecution where you don't think you can take it to a criminal justice outcome. There isn't enough. Whatever you have tried in your evidence capture, your investigation, uh, your victim might be currently unwilling, unable to um, provide further evidence of this, and they're not in the right place, but we know something's happened we can serve a domestic violence protection notice. It has to be authorised by a superintendent, and very frequently when I'm on call, I've got an out of bed to do this, I have to do them at weekends, and I applaud any officer that brings me and tells me the story, I say, stop where you are, I'm the domestic abuse lead, I'm gonna do it, so it's fine. And what we do is we consider the, the, the rights of the victim and the rights of the perpetrator, but what we do is we take that notice to court and we create a 28-day injunction. We do that here very, very well. The bit that we need to work on is, we have 28 days, what do we do with it? Do we keep checking on the perpetrator and keep reminding them that we know that they've got a 28-day order? Yes, we're getting better at that and we now always do a visit on the 27th day, so that's good. Are we supporting the victim? Well, we have Lighthouse in Avon, the Somerset, who do an amazing job of contacting and supporting our victims of crime. They know about every DVP and DVPO, and so what they do is they make sure that we are trying busily in that 28 days to sign sign those victims. What we're doing with the perpetrators, apart from visiting them, well, if we can get into some perpetrator management schemes, there might be some opportunities there. But at least what we do is we create some breathing space, and I think we're doing that very well. So I think we have, I think we've done well over 200 um, uh, orders, and we've got about a 98% success rate when they get to court. So that's fantastic. So I just think, so, so, so just to summarise, if we are going to get better at protecting victims of domestic abuse, if we are going to stem the tide and reduce and change nationally that figure of, of two uh, domestic homicides every day. It is actually about going back to basics. Nothing I have heard today from any of the speakers was actually beyond my, my intelligence. All of it, I could just say, that's easy. It's a series of easy things. It's legislation that's been around for years. It's all in our grasp, and policing is the same. Back to basics, do it right from the first call to the first point of contact, go, do a good job, do a thorough investigation, do a proper risk assessment, support the victim, listen to what they have to say, support them ongoing, manage the perpetrator properly. I don't think it's rocket science, and Avon Somerset Police is committed to doing much better in the protection of uh, victims of domestic abuse.